where I work, you have these kids who are kind of facing these mortal diseases and the therapies that are required to help them stay alive, you know, bone marrow transplants, intense oncology regimens. You know, these kids are in the hospital for months. I've known kids in the hospital for years and it's just like the reality. Ooh, I gotta go. I've been working, told them, please don't hit my phone. I'm in my zone, bro, just leave me alone. Was on the road, but I swear I'm coming home. Now the drinks on me, I think we need a toast. See, I did it for me. Now my old friends calling, told them nothing's for free. Told me time is money, dog, so I paid all my fees. I was starving for this day, now my fan they can't eat. Hey everyone, welcome to another podcast episode with your hosts, Peter and Matt. Thank you everyone for tuning back in. We appreciate you guys. We appreciate all the comment likes and all that. Continue doing that. We really appreciate it if you hit the five stars. It boosts us on the algorithm, it motivates us, and it keeps on helping us produce this high quality content that we do on this podcast. Mm -hmm. Cupofnurses.com for any information, updates on us. Cupofnurses.shop for all that sizzling hot merch that's out. Frontline Warriors, frontlinewarriors.shop. Just click the link in the description and it'll link you to everything. How you doing, Pete? I'm doing amazing. We have a returning guest today, David Metzger. He is a pediatrics oncology nurse. He's also an author. He recently wrote a book titled 16 Meditations on Parenthood from a Pediatric Oncology Nurse, which is available on Amazon. We talk about parenthood, how it feels to treat and take care of kids with cancer, as well as we talk about his book and just some of the stories that he has been through in life with with kids and the patients that he worked with. Hey, David Metzer, how's it going? I'm glad you're back on another episode. We last talked to you back in March and April. Can you just refresh our minds on, on what you do and just these these past six months that we haven't talked to you? Yeah, guys, has it been that long? <laughs> um, well, yeah, my name is David. I'm a pediatric oncology nurse over at UC San Francisco. And I recently released a book called Nurse Papa, which is about my experiences taking care of kids with cancer and really about how I've related that to being a parent myself and the journey of caring for others. And I know I, I briefly looked over the book. What is a valuable lesson you learned from everything? I know the meditations go into different parts. And I know you mentioned sometimes it's hard to come back as a father and look at everything from your pediatric patients and then just transferring that love and balancing between your wife and your kids and all that. Can you tell us a little bit about that experience? Yeah. I mean, the origin of the book was I was just seeing all these just stirring emotional, crazy scenes in the hospital. You know, life happens in a remarkable way in the hospital, especially with these kids who are dealing with these diseases. You know, they don't know what's going to happen tomorrow and especially their parents have no idea what tomorrow brings. And I thought that there could be a way where somebody could read this book and not have to experience what these parents do on a daily basis, but also could benefit from it. So kind of the best of both worlds would be able to read about it and really take in these lessons that, you know, these kids and their parents give to me. And, you know, we were just talking about what the world is going to be like in, in two years. We have no idea. There's so much crazy wars and, you know, there's this pandemic thing happening. You guys heard about that, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's kind of news everywhere. <laughs> yeah, I, I heard about it too. We've been living it. And, you know, one of the chapters in the book, the first chapter, in fact, is called Parenting for Today. And, you know, these parents, they undergo a, an existential crisis every day every hour, every minute, you know, that horrible reality that their child may die. And I've seen how they've reacted, you know, to this news and to this just basic mundane reality that they're facing. And it's been a real lesson to me that how, you know, you can truly live in the moment and find value in your life. And you can truly relate to people in a way that is honest and sometimes painful, but very real. And it, I think it's a real lesson for me and for parents and for anybody walking around that there's a way to not focus on what horrors the world's going to bring us in two years and really kind of focus on the next two minutes. Right. Yeah. I think that's a huge dilemma that we face in our society where we're so focused on the future, just like you said, two years or what's going to happen. 
And do you think that takes away from the love of your kids and the value they could provide to them at that present moment? Because your mind is drifting so far away thinking about if we're going to have enough food and shelter in two years of where we're going to live. Yeah, well, we have a deep pantry in my house. So I'm not too worried about that. But um, yeah, absolutely. absolutely. And you know, we don't even have to talk about climate change and the pandemic and whatever other craziness is happening. We can talk about what's distracting us right in front of us, like our phones or that meeting that's coming up or, you know, what we are going to have for lunch, you know, in two hours. What are you guys going to have for lunch in two hours, by the way? Uh, I have no idea. In two hours? Uh, probably some steak, I would say. I honestly had some Polish sausage with your bread already, so I'm good. <laughs> I'm probably going to have some protein pancakes afterwards. Damn nice. Well, I might join you in a little bit. <laughs> um, but yeah, there's so much to distract us from what's happening right in front of us. And I do think it takes away from, you know, the relationships that we have. And it's really, really hard to not be distracted by everything that's not important. 100%. And even and now through the pandemic, people are even more attached to the TV, the, the electronics. Uh, have you at work noticed uh, like a, maybe some hardships or some struggles that the children and the parents go through because of the pandemic? Oh, yeah. it's It's been crazy. You know, where I work, you have these kids who are kind of facing these mortal diseases and the therapies that are required to help them stay alive, you know, bone marrow transplants, intense oncology regimens. You know, these kids are in the hospital for months. I've known kids in the hospital for years and it's just like the reality. You know, they've been in quarantine for years already. It's so funny because I remember I was taking care of this little girl and it was just when the pandemic started and everybody was freaking out about, you know, stay at home and not being able to do their normal activities and she was like david i've been doing that for two years i don't know what people are freaking out about <laughs> and this was a six-year-old girl who like had such clarity on what life meant to her but you know the real tragedy of this pandemic for us has been just how we have not been able to give access to parents in the way that we they once had it you know beforehand a mom and dad and, you know, many family members were able to be with their kids in these really hard and sometimes joyful moments. But because of the pandemic and the obvious, you know, infection control um, and the obvious infection control, sorry, guys, um, and, you know, <laughs> um, because of the pandemic and the steps we've had to take to protect these kids, you know, we haven't been able to grant that access. So, you know, moms and dads have not both been able to be at the bedside. Relatives have not been, you know, been able to visit in the same way. So these kids are, you know, even more isolated than they once were. And it's it's been a real hardship. You know, we depend on the people we love to kind of carry us through these hard times. And when you can't have your mom and dad sitting by you when you're suffering and pain and, you know, really afraid, it, it affects how you heal. So, yeah, I hope to get back to where we once were. We're not there yet, but we're, we're getting back there. Yeah, 100%. Because when Matt and I were working the COVID units uh, back in California, it, it was heartbreaking to have like a 40-year-old patient, uh, you know, ask if, he could, his, if his mom could come or his dad or, you know, a family member, and you have to say say no. So I can only imagine how bad or detrimental that does for, for a child. Like a 6-year-old, 7-year-old, 8-year-old can't see like a family member just because of these, these restrictions. That's, right. that's horrible. Well, you brought up uh, something a little bit ago about uh, children being able, able to teach us things. Is there anything that you could um, maybe reflect back on where a child has taught you something that you kind of carry through life now? Because children could be very good teachers because a lot of times they look at things outside the box and they're not as programmed as we are. And once we're like 20, 30, 40 years, years old, yeah, we're stuck in that kind of program and these kids aren't really there yet. So is there any kind of child that has ever stuck out to you or taught you something very meaningful? I mean, there's so many. And you're right when you say kids kind of give us a new perspective. The one, well, one of the many cool things about being a parent is that you kind of get to live their experiences again, experiences that you kind of left behind and, you know, see, th see things the way you once saw them as a kid. Um, but one story I can tell you guys is really what, you know, motivated me to write this book in the first place. So I was, I had one child and I was expecting, you know, another with my wife and just in a couple of weeks, my son was about to be born and I accepted this patient. His name was Jason and he was coming to get a new liver, which was a huge thing for him. He was, you know, 
hopefully going to have a normal life or at least closer to normal what to what other kids experience. Um, and he got to the hospital and they did more of a workup on him and they discovered this giant tumor on his liver. So not only was he not going to get a liver transplant, but he was going to die. So his reality just switched poles. He, he was no longer going to be able to have a life. And, you know, the way this affected him, it was just this existential just departure. He just like withdrew from the world. So he was just facing this incredible amount of physical pain matched with this existential pain of just, you know, facing this dilemma. So I took care of him for a few weeks and it was really hard to kind of break through that barrier. You know, as a nurse, and I'm sure you guys know this, you know, the, the joys of being a nurse and taking care of others is that you really kind of get inside their worlds. And, you know, as you're helping to heal them, you become part of that process and you really learn so much about them. And through that process, learn about yourself. But I couldn't, I couldn't do that with Jason because he just, the only face he showed to the world was pain. It was just pain, 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 you know, in his mind, in his heart, in his body. And it was a real challenge to take care of him, not because I needed him to give me something, but because I wanted to, to join him in that journey so I could help take care of him. So one day, sorry, I don't, I don't mean to, I don't mean to interrupt, but that's probably so heartbreaking. No. Like as, as a kid, like all of you known is, is pain. And then somebody tells you, Hey, we're going to get you a new liver and this pain is going to go away. And the kid's finally thinking, Hey, my life's going to be normal. This pain is going to go away. And he comes to the hospital, yeah. gets a test done and sorry, Hey, we're not, that pain's not going to go away. We found another problem. Like that's crazy. Yeah. That's yeah it's my fuck you. Yeah. You know, this was pre pandemic. So this kid had tons of family around, you know, cousins underneath his bed playing and uncles and aunts kind of in the corner. It was a real scene, you know, you kind of when you get like a family re reunion together and everybody's kind of catching up, but they were catching up around this kid who was dying. And I remember a couple of weeks into his stay, I just decided that he needed, to, he needed to take a bath. Yeah. He was just like been in bed for days and he just, I understand where he was coming from. Like when you're dying, like the last thing you want to do is take a bath. Like it just must seem so irrelevant to you. But there's this connection you get when you engage in touch and closeness with another person. And I remember bathing him and he was kind of standing up and he was just so skinny and weak and he was kind of clutching onto my shoulders and it was a painful process. But at the end of it, he kind of worked his way through this tunnel. He just lay down on his bed and he put his hands behind his head. And if in another world, he would have been this teenager on some beach in the Caribbean because he just looked so calm and so relaxed. And in that moment, he looked at me and I felt that he saw me for the first time. Like he's seen me, but he didn't really see me. And I saw him too in this new way. And then that afternoon, his whole family had, you know, left the room and left us and the lights were off. And it was so quiet that I could hear the medication pump next to his bed just humming. And I thought he was sleeping and I was just in his room charting. And all, the, all of a sudden he said, David, and he'd never said my name before. Like, I didn't even know he knew my name. And I was so surprised. And I said, hey, Jason, what's up? What can I do for you? And he said, David, do you have cats? And I said, yeah, we have a cat actually, but she doesn't get much attention these days because, you know, we have a toddler and the cat's just, you know, second fiddle. And Jason said, oh, we have cats too. We have three of them, but we had to put one down because she was sick and old. And I said, Jason, that's so sad. I'm really sorry that you had to put your cat to sleep. And he said, David, it's okay. If you love cats, you have to get used to them dying. And, you know, in that moment, it was so clear that Jason was not talking about a cat. He was talking about himself and to see and witness a, a teenager have such a profound realization in that moment that if you love life, you have to accept dying because it's part of it. It just floored me. And in that moment, I, I knew I had to write about it. And I knew I had to write about all these stories that I saw and witnessed. Damn. Wow, that's a deep story. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, dude, I got definitely got goosebumps. I'm a little tear guy, but that's crazy, dude. Like, and and it's great. He's a teenager, and he's able to grasp that concept and already think on that kind of a level. And a lot of people our age and, and older, you know, they don't even understand that. 
And and this kid already understood where he where his place was in life. Yeah, this also kind of reminded me a little bit of uh, Marcus Aurelius meditations because he talks about the relationship with death and he talks about the relationship with death that we have from Western society. And I feel like we mentioned this before. We sure did. Yeah, I'm having now I'm having like this deja vu, deja vu moment. And it's like, imagine if we had a better relationship with this death than Western society. Mm -hmm. And it's crazy that this kid at this age had this, but we don't have it. And this correlates with the way we kind of handle things in our society or the pandemic. It's just we're cooped up living in fear because we think this is all that we have, this this vessel that is us, but it's more than that. Yeah. yeah, you know, what was really interesting to me about this pandemic is, you know, we were in close quarters with the ones we loved, like close. I learned so much more about my kids than I thought I would ever learn. And it was great in some ways, but... You know, did you ever feel yourself feeling more alone when you're surrounded by people? Because I feel like in many ways, we kind of forgot how to relate to those we love the most. And the pandemic was a real journey into how we kind of encountered each other. Right. It, it definitely put us in a, in a vulnerable place, especially if you had, let's just say, like poor communication with like your friends or your spouses or your family. You, you had really nobody else to talk to and to move and to move about with. Because the pandemic forced you to to just be at home all the time. Yeah. Even I had a, a masseuse and she told me, you know what? I can tell when somebody didn't have, hasn't been touched in months. So yeah, loneliness is a real thing. And people forgot what it feels to touch and interact. And uh, I don't want to talk about society, but it's scary where, with where we're going because we're becoming so damn disconnected, you know, mm -hmm. with everything. And um you know, masks are beneficial and all that, but now we're we're losing that characteristics that means so much. There's so much information in the smile and your teeth and facial expression, how you're feeling. I, you can read a person by looking at that. And that's all gone. And it's just, um, you know, we're disconnected from ourselves and we're just going deeper into technology for answers. And it's, it's lonely. We're losing the human experience almost. Yeah. And we're being like, uh, I don't know Elon Musk or whoever those those people are. Like they're 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 saying that the world's getting geared more towards technology, and this is like a giant leap towards that, because a lot of our access to our friends, our family is just through a phone now. We don't even see them in person because of the of the, the pandemic. So you're becoming more and more reliant on this technology, and less and less on on, on like society and social aspects and actual interactions. Yeah, because you might not even need that in the future. Yeah, we which is we, sad. We talked about death and how can families taken this information and how can they cope with death or the acceptance of death when it comes to their, to their loved one, especially a small, you know, child in the pediatric setting? Yeah. I mean, that's a big question. And I wish I had the answer to that. I mean, we were just talking about how we relate to each other and how much we depend on our, you know, our mouths and our noses and our faces to kind of communicate our empathy and, you know, our presence. But I feel like in some ways we adapted, you know, I learned how to show love, frustration, every other emotion just with my eyes. I learned how to be with somebody just by standing there in a way that felt, you know, that felt comforting. And, you know, we forget that we have so many other ways of expressing ourselves, of caring ourselves. And, you know, that stuff can, can go beyond just what we say and, you know, if we're smiling or, or not, but, you know, to that effect, I think how we carry ourselves, how we are with each other can really help us all deal with, you know, these just harsh realities, you know, being present with each other and being fully there with each other. You know, there's so much, I always say this, there's so much living that goes on in this place where so many kids are dying, <clears throat> excuse me. And, you know, I'll, I'll enter a room and there's laughter, there's homework. Oh my gosh, cancer can't even make homework go away. And, you know, there's so much opportunity to live your life, even when that life is going to be short lived. So the one piece of advice that I could offer is that there's time, there's time to say these things, there's time to ask somebody how they feel. Um, and in those moments, you can really find some peace, you can really find what you can discover what somebody truly wants, because I find that so many of these kids all they want to do is make their kid, their parents happy. All they want to do is make their parents, their parents not afraid anymore. And the one way that they can do that is by kind of communing together and by really exposing those difficult, painful roots and just laying them out there. 
what if there's family that's not seeing that point and they're still down about the situation? How do you come as the nurse advocate in this situation? How do you facilitate that growth so they both have that mutual understanding and there's acceptance from the family? Or I'm sorry, there's acceptance from both parents for the child because that's all that the child wants, right? Sure. And that's a very ideal position to reach for. I think it's not necessarily um, realistic all the time. It's not black and white. Um, you know, I've encountered so many situations in which the parents are not on the same page. You know, one is ready for end of life. One isn't. One believes in God. One doesn't. You know, how do you overcome these, you know, these barriers that you didn't even know you had? Because before you had kids, it didn't matter. You know, you could just live your life and enjoy each other. But once you have kids, fellas, and I know you probably will in the future, if that happens, you'll see how hard it is to navigate these relationships when you're raising other little human beings. But I think as a nurse in a room, at least for me, I have pretty much become accustomed to being the most positive person in the room. I mean, that's what you are when you're a pediatric oncology nurse. You are just like that person who has to, you know, bring each another person up. You have to raise them up. And there's a presence that you can kind of provide that allows for that kind of communication. You're not going to make people see eye to eye. It's just not going to happen. But you can kind of guide them in the right direction. For instance, I was taking care of this little baby who I've, he's been around the hospital for the last year or so, just kind of dealing with the different after effects of his bone marrow transplant. And throughout most of his time, his, his father was the one who took care of him. And, you know, of course, we only have one parent at the bedside right now these days, mostly. So his mom, I feel she really missed out on some bonding that was really important because this kid is not even one yet. So like, it is those times when you're imprinting on each other that you learn to love each other and understand each other. So this kid was in his crib. He was like a maniac, you know, a tethered to IV lines, but just in his crib, you know, rolling around and having fun and sometimes crying. And his mom was just sitting there. Like, I just, I couldn't understand why she wasn't engaging. But then I put her, I put myself in her shoes and tried to imagine what it would be like to kind of try to engage with this child that maybe you don't know that well. So I, I opened the crib and I picked him up and I tried to show how I would do that with my own kids because you can tell people things, but you can't necessarily make them do it. So I play with them. I talk to him. I spent a few minutes just kind of communing with him. And then I just handed the baby to the mom and left the room. So there's ways in which you can kind of show how you would do it, even if that's right or wrong and give them the opportunity to try it themselves. Right. Sometimes you just got to put that person in that situation and, and usually the person does the right thing and kind of takes like takes the, the right steps and kind of goes from there. I'm sure that's probably what happened. I'm sure it, it led to like a very positive impact on, on her life. Right. The mom. I hope so. <laughs> I don't really know. I mean, she took her son um, and I left the room and, you know, it's not about one moment. It's about a lot of those moments and it's not about there being a right or wrong, although it sometimes feels like that. It's all about just kind of transmitting your own experience and trying to raise people up. Yeah, I mean, a lot of things aren't right or wrong. They're just like stuff that we we have to kind of do, right? It's hard to always gauge a situation as as a or a choice as a right choice or a wrong choice because we all have different opinions and different ways of yeah. doing things. But David, I wanted to ask since you've been uh, in a hospital for quite a bit of, bit of time, what is the like one of the things that you see as like the most common struggle for for parents? Uh, having a kid in, in a hospital, in a pediatric oncology? Is it like the struggle between the family dynamics, between like the, the mom and dad, or usually problems there? Or is it, or I, I'm not really sure how to give another example because I, I don't work with that, but what's what's a common struggle you see between the families? I mean, it's endless. <laughs> I, there's just the the bleak reality of trying to raise a family while your child is, while one child is in the hospital and the other child is not. I mean, I can't even imagine what these parents go through when they have a kid who's at school or not in school, who's sitting in front of the computer at Zoom school and another child who's, you know, in a hospital room throwing up. Like the first thing that happens is that you split your resources. You know, you have just less attention to each child or you have one parent who kind of further develops that relationship with their five-year-old while their seven-year-old doesn't remember what it's like to hug them. And vice versa, the parent at home who is taking care of the seven-year-old but doesn't remember what it's like to hear their two-year-old giggle 
because you know they feel that so that they feel that separate from them. I don't personally have the experience of this, but what I've seen is that it's just incredibly challenging, just on a utilitarian level of just trying to make it through the day. And then there's you know navigating the different choices that you have to make as a parent: peanut butter or jelly, or you know cheese sandwich. That's you know that's the choice I make in the morning for my kids, and they hate them both. But you know, when you're talking about a chemotherapy regimen or you know decisions to make at end of life, you're really adding some stress into this relationship. So I've seen so many families just be ripped apart. You know, it, just divorces that happen even after a child is cured, it's horrible. But on the same token, I've seen so many parents come together in this way that you just can't believe they were able to do. So you know, the challenges are endless. And the solutions to those challenges are are also endless. It's just kind of which ones do we find and how do we go about fixing ourselves? Yeah, 100%. You mentioned that you are always like the most positive person in a room. You always have to transfer that energy onto others. And being a nurse myself, I know that's very taxing both mentally and physically. How do you rejuvenate your own cup? How do you go back home and deliver that same amount of energy to your family as you did for other families? You don't <laughs> No, we were just talking about how it's not black and white. And, you know, one of the struggles I have, and I talk about a lot in my book, Nurse Papa, is that I sometimes feel like the, the best human being I can be at, at work. I am just like, just at the top of my game, dealing with people, interacting with people, just being a good nurse. And I'll get home and I am just a horrible human being. <laughs> And, you know, that's my own perception, of course, like, you know, because you want to be able to be the kind of caregiver you are at the hospital for your kids at home. But the scenes that you enter at home, they can just be disconcerting. You just see the chaos that you left behind in the morning. And it is so hard to kind of step up and be that dad who is just always there. And I do my best. I just recognize that I'm a flawed human being and that it's okay to be flawed. I don't want my kids to think that you have to be perfect. So I may scream at them, I may lose my patience, but I'm always aware of it. And I always go back to them and kind of ask them how they feel about it and try to repair those moments that, you know, I wasn't the best I could be. You know, you learn how to be a parent. It's not, there's no guidebook to it. Although, you know, tons of people, including myself, have written books about how they think it should go, but it's just never easy. And you have to expect those bumps in the road. And I'm okay with being imperfect. And I'm just kind of one man just trying to be a better dad a better nurse and a better husband. Yeah. Being imperfect is what makes each of us so beautiful because, you know, our, our imperfections, sometimes people see, see it as like the perfection in, in us, you know, and that's also what makes the vulnerable is our imperfections because if we're all perfect, you will never need a significant other. You will never need somebody else in your life or something else in your life if we're all perfect. If you're imp imperfect, you need somebody to kind of fill that void. But before we move on to your book, I just want to ask what, What's some thing that you've learned for, from being a parent that you could give some tips to somebody that's like maybe a new parent or just maybe think about being a parent in the future? That's a really good question. <laughs> I mean, I think the obvious answer is being present and always remembering what you have. Um, you know, it's really easy to get bogged down in getting to school, getting to wherever you have to go, making sure things get done. But the life that occurs in those moments, just like in the hospital, the laughter and the sadness that happens between therapies, it's really important. And honestly, it's what life is all about. So just taking a second to stop, breathe, remember what you have, remember where you are, and you know, truly interact with your family. I mean, I think that is just the ultimate lesson. I, I can't think of anything that's more important to be present and also to add on to that i don't have any kids but i would my piece of advice from my experience would be just to let go of those ex expectations sometimes i feel like you know it could be going to disney or taking your fam out to a picnic and you have like this vision in your mind that you want it to go this way and things don't work out or you're late and uh we beat our own selves up like that own self-critic that says it should have been this way or that's missing or maybe you're with your family and you're smiling and you're joyful and then you still have that little roommate in your head that's telling you that's something that's bad too you know but that's my own little self journey and what i'm improving on to let go of expectations because it 
it really takes away the happiness that's already there. Really it reduces great. it, yes. And it's, Don't take your kids to Disney. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, I, I have a funny story about that. I did take my daughter to Disneyland when she was three years old, and it was way too early. And I, you know, I, I grew up right around there, so I, I have tons of memories of enjoying it. I'm sure that those memories are tainted by the misery that my parents felt at the same time. And it was just not a good day. I had so many expectations for, you know, what I thought it would be you know, just the magical kingdom. And it was the magical consumerism. <laughs> and, you know, all my all my kids wanted was just to buy something and it, it kind of stabbed me in my heart. So letting go of those expectations, I think that's wonderful advice. I'm surprised that, um, that you came up with it without having kids because it is the number one lesson that you learn absolutely because you have so many ideas about what your life's gonna be like and then your kids just come over and just stamp on it. And it's exactly what they're supposed to be doing. Yeah, I think we, we learned that at like a younger age, um, like the expectation stuff, like going on dates and even probably like, like your family and stuff and just knowing people, you set expectations on, on how a date's gonna go or how your day's gonna go or you plan all this out. And one thing doesn't work out the way it's supposed to and you're just thinking about that one thing. So it's very good. Like I feel like a lot of people have to keep that in mind to go on these things without expectations. And yeah. sometimes it's even funner without any expectations. You just kind of go at it as is, you know. It seems like kids teach you the ultimate lesson in stoicism, which is just to let go and just keep going. And, you know, you wanted your kid to, to say thank you for taking me to Magical Kingdom. And I love this, you know, <laughs> this time with you. But really, it's like, I want to get that toy. And then it's like you're just losing the value of what you want it to be. Yeah, yeah the, the ultimate example of stoicism is bouncing on a large exercise ball at three in the morning, holding a crying toddler that's screaming in your ear and just trying to make it through the moment. In that moment, you are the most stoic being that has ever existed. I bet. Good perspective. At the same time, screaming for your wife to get you the baby formula, maybe so you could put it back to sleep, right? <laughs> yeah, stoicism also requires action sometimes. <laughs> for your book, uh, 16 Meditations uh, on, on Parenthood, uh, what's that exactly about? Is, is it 16 different stories or what's what's in it? So there's so many stories that kind of come out in this book. You know, I realized very early on um, two things. One, that these couldn't be just my stories because I can't be in every room. And I also don't want people just to hear my perspective. So for this book, I interviewed so many people, you know, tons of my coworkers, nurses, doctors, parents who I... Uh, people whose kids I'd taken care of. Often these kids were deceased and even some patients. And I realized how important those views were. And slowly it became very evident that there were some very concrete ways that you could view the world and kind of change your perspective that might be really valuable. And the other thing that all, be, soon became very obvious was that for people to be interested in reading this, I would have to frame it in a way that there was, if not actionable things to do, but actionable ways to relate to the world. So, you know, eventually each chapter kind of became separate into a separate meditation on parenthood, on life, on ways you can be happier. And within each chapter, many stories occur in which this very specific lesson kind of just becomes obvious. I tried not to be heavy handed because I don't like to read things like that where an author is telling me what to do. And, you know, in the beginning of the book, I'm very straightforward with the reader that I'm not an expert in parenting. I'm on this journey with you, but I have a perspective that you probably don't have. And I really wanted to share it with you. That's awesome. A after consuming your own book or taking time to read it and interviewing, did you have any profound like ah moment like, wow, this is maybe what I was missing in my parenting or maybe I wish I knew this sooner when I first had my child? I mean, the first prof profound moment I had was when I got my first copy from my publisher and I expected to feel really happy like that after five years of writing this, it was done and I was ready to move on. And then I was holding this bound of paper, this sheath of, you know, of tree skin in my hand. 
and I got really sad and I was so surprised by that realization because I, I just saw all that work and all that emotion and, and all that time bound together in, you know, in hundred or 205 pages. And it just made me feel really desperate that I'd wasted my time. I don't think that's what I did, but, um, you know, it kind of points out the kind of profound irony and the human experience that what we do, you know, maybe it's not all that important, but, um, you know, one thing I was thinking of recently, and it, I was kind of embarrassed to have this realization, but I was also really happy that it came to me. You know, as a nurse, I've been working as a pediatric oncology nurse for 13 years, and I've seen so much, so much stuff that I want to unsee, stuff to, that I wish I could change. And at some point, and I'm sure you guys feel the same way regarding your profession, you kind of become desensitized you kind of, at some point you go through the motions and you don't take it in the way you once did. And I saw that happening in myself. And I think subconsciously that was part of the reason I wrote this book because I wanted to feel again. And, you know, the way that we start to feel again is we reflect and we kind of follow the example of others. So what better way to kind of really feel the death of a child or the pain of a child by having other people experiencing it? and also see how they feel. You know, it's kind of selfish of me, but you know, the way that I find my journey back to kind of really being with a child in a way that I once was when I was a new nurse is to kind of share that experience with others. Yeah, well, David, I'm telling you right now, you for sure do not waste any of your time at all. Like, I, I always love talking to you just because you always give so much amazing insight on parenthood and pediatrics and just children in general. I feel like I always get a, get a good takeaway. And I'm sure everyone's going to love your book. I even checked it out on Amazon. You got like five ratings on there. I think like five stars. So it's looking pretty promising. Yeah, the stars are coming in. And it was, you know, number one best-selling new release in pediatrics. So, but that doesn't mean anything to me. Um, I, you know, I don't know what you guys' love language is. Mine is affirmation. So I do, I do appreciate when people enjoy this. And, you know, I'll take every good review with happiness. But I really want people just to experience it and to, you know, and read it because what else are we doing, right? I mean, why do you guys have a podcast? Why are you nurses? Why are we interacting with each other? We just want to share what we have. And if I can share what I have, I'm just so stoked to do it. And I also love what you mentioned about kind of revisiting that same experience you had when you were a new grad nurse and that ah moment or that happy feelings you had, which over time, maybe that was a little bit of PTSD with compassion fatigue and just overworked and it, you became desensitized and numb to that experience when you had your patients. So I hope, just like you say, with people reading your book, they have that energy back into them and they had, they, they're like rejuvenated to help again and help because they see the beauty in taking care of these patients and kids and everything. You're basically a teacher. Yeah. Just by writing that book. Just, just about, when you go to school, school teaches you like ideas and concepts and what to kind of um, expect, you could say. And, and your book is probably going to be a really good book for people to take a look at, especially if they're new to, uh, you know, death and children and like that kind of situations. Yeah, I hope so. And, you know, as far as what I've seen, the reaction I've had, you know, people who have appeared in the book and people who have had their stories shared, they do find a, a great amount of joy in, in reading about their children or reading about their brothers. But what was surprising to me, and I was grateful for this, was that people who don't have kids, people who have kids, but their kids aren't sick, they were also profoundly affected by the stories that I was able to tell. And not only were they profoundly affected, but they were able to you know, take the same lessons and kind of change their lives. Um, and that's, that's the ultimate compliment that, you know, something I wrote can really affect the way they parent, you know, to their healthy child, because that's what it's all about. It's not about waiting for that moment when your child has leukemia. It's about the five years up to that point when you develop your relationship with that child. You know, when the rubber hits the road and your child is sick, that's where you need to be a good parent. I hate that fact that we don't realize it. Like we don't realize things through happiness and joy. We realize it when it's, I don't want to say it's anger gone. as an emotion, but when, when that joy isn't there anymore, you can't grasp it anymore because your child is, has a six month, you know, 
survival rate or whatever that may be that's that's so sad that as humans we have to go to that damn experience to get smacked on the face and be like okay hey this is important my kid is important not me being a truck driver for 80 hours a week and not seeing my family whatever the case might be yeah yeah, yeah david well, for I want- all those truck drivers out there there's <laughs> there's a path back yeah there's yeah. A- <laughs> yeah like when i talk to david and i'm sure your book's going to be just as compelling you make me feel very fortunate because like, cause I'm a healthy individual, even though I, I had surgery last year, like it's all over with. Um, but one of, one of my biggest fear is in, in life is having a, a child that's, that's sick. That's one of my, that's literally my biggest fear. Like death doesn't even compare to, to that. Like I would rather die than have a, a sick child. Like that's one of the scariest things, things for me ever. And when you bring it up, you make me feel very fortunate that, that I grew up as, as a healthy kid, that my parents are healthy, that people around me are healthy, that the kids I grew up with are healthy, that like my friends are healthy. And I, cause I've never been around uh, sick children. I, I've, I've, the only time I've been around sick children was, was probably the time my sister went to the hospital and she got diagnosed with diabetes. But that was the, the only time where I witnessed sick children. That's one of the reasons why I went to nursing as well. And I always love talking to you just because you, you bring those emotions out for me that, that, kind of for, that I kind of forget about and I kind of put to the side. And you know the ego, ego comes into play and, and all that. And you kind of really humble me that my life could have been completely different. My parents' life could be completely different. And my future life, if my kids come out sick, I kind of almost know what to expect. And you, you're give, you kind of give me that advice on what emotions I'm going to feel on how families struggle. So I could kind of prepare for that if that were to happen, which I hope hopefully doesn't happen to me nor anybody that, that I know. But it's very humbling when I talk to you. And I'm sure your, your books are going to do the same thing to many people. I mean, I hope so. And can I tell you a secret? You know, that's my biggest fear too, that my child will be sick. And it's so interesting because I can take care of a six-year-old and you know, my daughter is six who has leukemia. And I can say to myself, gosh, I'm so lucky that my daughter doesn't have leukemia. But she might have leukemia when she's eight. She might have it when she's 22. So it's, you know, it's this, it's this constant kind of reaffirmation of how lucky we are. And, you know, it never ends. You just kind of have to keep, you know, walking this journey and realizing, sometimes forgetting, you know, how lucky you are. And, you know, there's a, a new episode of my podcast coming out in a couple of days where I really encounter this idea of caring for a sick, a sick child and then going home and trying to care for my daughter and son at home. And it is a giant twist in orientation when you just leave the hospital and go home. So I, I don't feel like anybody has really figured out the way to make this all better, but you just kind of have to constantly readjust and remember how lucky you are. And also in those moments when you're not lucky, hoping that the luck will find you soon. Right. Exactly. Interesting perspective. Yeah. Cause when I, when I see like, for example, uh, my sister, when I got diagnosed with diabetes, like I, I hated it when that happened. The reason being because I would rather have that happen to me than somebody else kind of situation. That's what I see. If I ever have kids and they're sick, the part that's going to piss me off the most and make me hate that experience the most is the fact that they're going through that, not me. Because I feel like it should have been put on me or, or I would have had a better time going through it. That's kind of how, how I think of things. I'm not sure if that's how you kind of process it as, as well. But I'd rather have that pain be on me than somebody like my child or somebody that, that, that I know. That's oh, that, that drives me crazy. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I've had a great life. I'm, I turned 45 two days ago and my son turned five. So he was born on my, on my 40th birthday. I don't even have a birthday party anymore. It's just like whatever happens, it's, it's superhero themed. So it's all about him. But, um, yeah, I, I, I could die right now after this interview, of course, and I'd be okay with it. I've had such luck and such fortune in this life. I would for sure be that person who stepped in, you know, to take the pain and the suffering away from my kids, but you don't get that opportunity. That's the, the hard part. You don't get to make that choice. These parents don't get to make that choice, but they get to make the choice about the parents they want to be. That's the choice they have. Yeah. It's also, sorry, just to get you guys off here. It's interesting being behind this mic and listen to this conversation because I usually can chime in with good intelligence or scenario or just like, there's like a lack of words sometimes with like, how do you, you know, stay humble or how do you cope with that feeling of, it happened to them, not me and all that, right? Mm. It's just like lack of words. There's no way to, it's hard to say. To, to, to have a better outlook of that pers- um, of that situation. Mm-hmm. I, I was asked, now that we're talking about death, I was asked a really interesting question 
uh, by someone in the steam room like years and years back. And, and he was like, if you were to choose who would die first, you or your spouse, what would you choose? And I was like, it's a random question. He's like, think about it. And I, I was thinking about it like years after randomly. I had like a dream and I, and I thought about it afterwards. And personally, I would rather have my significant other die before me. Just what the rationale is, is I don't want to, when I'm dead and I'm and gone, I don't want to see that person struggling with, with missing me or me not being there to, to help out. That's why it kind of sounds selfish. Like you'd rather have your spouse die before you, but it would be heartbreaking that in the afterlife, I would have to see my spouse going through a hard time. You'd rather take the emotional burden. Exactly. Right? I'd rather take the emotional burden of, of, of that struggle. So yeah, I'll, well, all, all the big questions happen mm -hmm. in the steam room, right? Yeah, right. right. <laughs> and yeah. in the shower. Mm -hmm. in the shower yeah and then <laughs> well, those are the questions we ask ourselves <laughs> right and, and that blew my mind because i was trying to figure out like i knew i was trying to figure out because i was still young i was like early 20s so my frontal my frontal lobe hasn't fully developed yet so i couldn't you know um figure figure it out but then eventually i i, I realized that hey that's the reason why i would have my spouse die before me for for for, for that kind of situation yeah how's I, that frontal lobe doing doing these days i, I think it's still lacking you know, <laughs> you got kicked in the head a couple of days ago, man. Yeah, I so I don't know what's going on. <laughs> kicked in the head from the patient? Oh, uh, no, 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 no. Because uh, Matt and I, uh, while we're in Chicago, I'm doing jiu jitsu and I'm doing some kickboxing. And I'm, oh, I'm not man. very good, so I usually take more damage than all the, all the other guys, you know? I was wondering what happened to Matt's ears. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, the cow fires from the. Yeah. That yeah, was, and it, you know, it's really interesting what you say because, you know, Matt, it's how do you put yourself in that position? You can't, you haven't had that experience. And that's the whole point behind the book to be able to read about it, to not have to experience it, but to actually gain from it. And, you know, that's why we have art. That's why we have literature. That's why we have movies. It's a way of finding a experience outside of yourself and growing from it without actually having to stand over a bed of a dying child. I mean, I think it's a, a great thing to have the opportunity to do, to not suffer, but learn. Very good point. And there's no need to be worrying about those circumstances, whether you whether they'll happen or not, that's irrelevant. But there's no point to worry and pay a debt you never owe. That's how I see it. Mm. But I like that perspective because yes, you could just gain a knowledge from any any literature and extract and then prepare for the situation if it were to rise in the future. Absolutely. Yeah. David, are you into any other hobbies or anything that you do outside of work, family, kids, authoring or writing? <laughs> Yeah, podcasting. Well, yeah, I do all these things. And somebody asked me recently, how do you do that? You, you know, you, you work at the hospital, you have a full time job, you wrote a book, you have a podcast, you know, you're, you do lots of stuff. <laughs> I do clean the house too. I, I tell my wife that I do clean the kitchen. Um, you know, the way I spend my time is it's sporadic. I, one thing I learned being a parent is that you can, uh, you can do so much in 10 minutes. So if, if I have 10 minutes where my kids are, you know, happy and doing something, I'll try to write or I'll try to think about something I want to do. So it's really taught me to kind of find the flow in the short moments I have. But, you know, these days when I'm not doing anything that's trying to be productive, I try to do things that are not productive. I try to spend time on the water, I have a paddle board and just being out there and not, you know, not... It, engaging with the world has been really amazing to me, especially during the pandemic when it just felt like the world was so toxic and continues to be, it felt good just to be out there with nature. So like the next step I'm kind of moving that to is, you know, learning how to surf in my paddle board. So I'm buying a new one in which I can kind of interact with the water even more. So not just float upon it, but just like surf it the way I used to surf a surfboard. So that's kind of what's giving me sanity these days. Yeah, it's awesome. We all need we all need that one activity or something just to kind of just to have on our own and just and just do it because we get so caught up with everything. Our mind always races and we need that we need that exit, at least for a little bit. So you guys do martial arts to find that? Um I have, I mean I just like being active. Either the gym, martial arts, I need I need movement. Like today I didn't go to the gym in the morning and I already feel like irritable. I need to do some kind of activity in the morning, otherwise I'll feel irritable. So I'm probably going to go a little bit later. I just got a movement in my life. I have to. Yeah. I remember I took a boxing class and, you know, doing the circuit. I don't know if any of your listeners have taken the boxing circuit class. You just kind of go through this 20 kind of the set of, you know, 20 exercises. And at the end you spar. And I remember I used to love punching people. 
but I hated getting punched. <laughs> it's interesting because today I actually was surfing through the web and I noticed that hospitals are offering, you know, the therapy for uh, like to break something or break a plate or you could just crack a TV with something. They're doing it in a mm. hospital where a nurse or a doctor could come there and break something as a form of uh, release. But is that oh, yeah. a good form of release though? Like what if you become reliant on breaking things? You know what I'm saying? Just don't come to my house when you do that. <laughs> That's yeah. what I'm saying. Do not come for dinner, you know? Like, they should probably have thought of a better idea than, hey, enter room and start breaking stuff. Like, maybe, yeah. like, communication or talking to somebody because you're going to kind of, um, if your body's going to adapt to you breaking something as a, as a relief, that's not very healthy, right, in the long run. Hopefully, they don't connect those neural circuits. But if they do, I'm sure they'll find a pill to stop the doctors from breaking <laughs> stuff and so they can I mean, continue doing their job. <laughs> maybe if you apologize to the plate before you snatch it to the wall. That, yeah. Have a little but, bit of know, sentimental feeling behind it, you know? Yeah. But I think also if you place it within a therapeutic context and it's kind of understood that this is a way of releasing, a way of kind of getting out this kind of just Neanderthal energy, I think it, it can be productive. But you're right. It's, yeah, you need to, and you need to take a drug with caution. Take it at the right yeah. time. Yeah, it's yeah. like drinking. It's like, hey, can you have it socially? But if you're drinking alone to... Uh, make you feel better emotionally, that's where you got to draw the line. So mm. hopefully they can do the same with throwing plates. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Time and yeah. place for everything, right? Yeah. The time and place for breaking plates, time for time and place for eating off them. You know, it's all good. <laughs> <laughs> so David, where can everybody find you? So they can find me in Oakland, California. But if you uh, want to find my book, you can find it on Amazon, Nurse Papa. The, um, and you can go to my website at uh, nursepapathebook.com. You can also hear about, you know, my book on my podcast where I talk about these parent, these stories of parenthood and, you know, try to come out on the other side with, you know, a better understanding of what it, what it means to be a parent and a human in this really complicated world. And if you have Instagram too, David? I am on Instagram, although I'll be honest with you guys, I really suck at social media. If, if anybody has any tips for me, I, I, I'll, I'll welcome them. But I'm at Nurse Papa the Book on Instagram and at Nurse Papa on Twitter. But um, I try not to spend too much time there these days. But if you want to reach me, you can reach me at david at nursepapathebook.com. I think paddle boating is a better alternative for your mental sanity with everything that you're doing versus social media. So continue doing that. And I'm sure social media will work itself around. But I highly suggest anybody listening to check out David's book. He put a lot of work into it. And just like we said, you don't have to experience the the trials and tribulations of life with, with what could happen with your child. You could just experience it through the, through the book and learn something from it if anything were to arise. It's very true. Thanks, guys. It's been a real pleasure to talk to you again. It, it's always great to talk to you. Yep. You as well, David. Thank you, David. I'm sure going to have you on a few more times. We have to. Absolutely. Next book. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> have a good one. Bye, David. Take care.